This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. So good to have you in the presence of God today to just be where He is. is a special place, and we're deeply thankful to Him for the impact of His Spirit and grace in our lives. God is an awesome God. And we love him and we thank him so much that he is a faithful father. He's faithful to his word. And whenever you come into the presence of God, you ought to have this question in your heart. Lord, is there a word from you? Is there a word from the Lord? Is there a word from the Lord? And one of the reasons that I say that is because the word of the Lord is a sure thing. In fact, he said that heaven and earth would pass away, but not one jot or one tittle of the word would ever pass away. You know what a tittle of the word is? You know like the letter J, the little dot that goes over it? That's a tittle. Like the letter I and the little dot, that go, that's a tittle. The Lord said that not one tittle, not one little piece, of this thing will ever pass away. It is sure. Listen, listen. He's saying not one piece of the word of God will ever fail. Now let me help you to understand that if you save food from a restaurant and bring it home, put it in the refrigerator, I know you had every intention of eating it and sometimes a few days later, you go and you realize, I've had this too long now, I can't eat it, it's bad. It's gone bad. Your actions and your intentions didn't meet up. You had every intention of when you put the food in the refrigerator that you were gonna eat it later, but it went bad before you could get to it. And God says no, long, no matter how long, my word has been sitting. No matter how long you've been waiting on this thing to come to pass, be not weary in well-doing. Though the vision tarries, wait for it. Because if God ever gives you a word, it'll never go bad. It'll never go bad. It'll never go bad. He watches over his word to perform it. He watches over his word to say, I'm gonna go down even if I didn't get it to them, I'm going to get it to their child. I'm going to get it to their son, to their daughter. Even if I didn't give it to them, I'll give it to their grandchild. I, I'm a, this word, yeah, 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 whatever God, whatever God, whatever he has said in his word, you can bank on it. It's not going to spoil. It's not going to go bad. God will honor his word. There's a solidness in the word. There's a surety in the word. Blessed assurance in the word of God. I'm telling you, it's good. It's good. It's good for now. It's good for you. It's good for your children, for your grandchildren, for your great-grandchildren. It will never go bad. It will never go bad. It will endure forever and forever and forever hallelujah to the word lamb of god he'll let that word sit on your coffee table until you wake up until you get hungry. He said, it'll be there, it'll be there. It'll be there. The word works. The word works. It'll never spoil. It'll never go bad while you're sitting there waiting to read it. 
It'll never go bad while you're waiting to confess it and to declare it and to claim it. God's word is sure. His word is sure. God's word is sure. The word of the Lord is so strong that when God begins to speak, dead things will rise up and live. And things that ought to be dead will lay down and die. When the word of the Lord God can speak a word to you and say, be healed, be healed, be healed in Jesus' name. He can take things that have been closed and say, open up and it'll open. And he can say, be closed and it'll shut and it'll be closed at the word of the Lord. The word never gets old. It never gets old. It's like the blood. It never loses its power. That, my Baba Shia. It never, she Baba, anybody know anything about the power of the blood and the power of the word? You don't have to make a choice between the two. You get both. When you accept Jesus, you get both. It's the blood, the, the blood and the word, the spirit and the word agree in one. And it'll never go bad. It'll never go bad. The word will never go bad. Tell somebody next to you, the word will never go bad. It'll never go bad. The word will never, ever go bad. Some of you got your word right there. That's, that's just the appetizer. The word, hey, glory, will never go bad. <laughs> yes. There is as much power and efficacy in the word of the Lord that he speaks. And your spirit can come alive and you can be rejuvenated. And tiredness will pour off of you like water off of a duck's back. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to Jesus. Yes, something is moving in this house. Something is stirring in this house. in your praise there's deliverance in your praise there's healing in your praise there's confirmation in your praise
Yeah! <laughs> yes! And if you love him, say yes, say yes, say yes, 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 yes. it's been so good. Been so good, been so good, it's been so good, been so good, yeah, 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 been so good. He made a way. Has he ever made a way for you? He made a way. Yes, he made a way. He made a way. He made a way. He made a way. Father, we declare that there is absolutely none like you. We yield to you, Lord God, and we say, have your way. May the winds of your spirit blow everything away from us that is unlike you. So that only the things that remain in us, Lord, are those things that cannot be shaken. I pray, Father, that you'll let a fire rest upon each of us. So that what remains is purged and sanctified by the power of your spirit by the power of the blood and by the anointing that is on your word. Father, I pray that you'll give us ears to hear today what the Spirit has to say to the church. Cause us to grow, Lord, and to mature in our hearts toward you so that we might be a fruitful fragrance, delightful fragrance in your nostrils. Father, fill us through and through with your peace. Let your love permeate saturate every fiber of our being so that may you get glory out of all that we say and all that we do and father I thank you that you even allow there to be a holy hush that comes to quiet all of the chatter of every demonic voice that is around us speaking Well, Father, we're only aware of your presence and your glory and your truth. Have your way in us. And we covenant to give you the glory and the praise and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah to Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> glory, glory, glory. If we went home now, we'd be blessed. Hallelujah. We're just going to look at one verse of Scripture today. Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. In the New Living Translation, notice there these words. Look, I am sending you out as sheep among wolves. So be as shrewd as snakes and harmless as doves. I'm going to talk today simply from the message, snake lessons. Snake lessons. Snake lessons. Jesus said, be shrewd as, as snakes and yet harmless as doves. That verse reads in the Amplified Version. It says, listen carefully. This is Jesus talking. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves, having no self-serving agenda. 
Now, this is a part of, of Jesus sending us out into the world. He's talking to his disciples, the Christ followers, saying, go out. I'm sending you out into the world like sheep uh, in the midst of wolves. And so because I'm sending you out into a dangerous, precarious environment where there is a capricious nature of the enemy that is roaming around and doesn't have positive intentions toward you because whether you realize it or not, uh, when a wolf sees a sheep, it doesn't think about petting him. But he's licking his, his, his lips, his tongue is salivating because he realizes his dinner is here. And so he says, I'm sending you out into a world like that because there is a gospel mission, a commission, a great commission that each of us has to be a part of. This is not just relegated to 12 apostles or 70 disciples. This is a message for every Christ follower to say that I'm a part of those that Jesus is sending out into the world where there are wolves and we are the sheep. And he is our shepherd. The Lord is our shepherd. The shepherd is designed there for sheep. Shepherds don't sh shepherd wolves. They shepherd sheep. And he's saying, I'm sending you out like sheep, but in the midst of wolves. And because of that, I want you to walk into the world with a wisdom. So he says, be wise as a snake and yet harmless as a dove. So he's saying uh, that there's a duplicitous nature of being wise as a serpent. So that when you're in business, you need to be wise as a serpent to say, you know what? You can talk all you want, but you're going to pay me my money. But harmless as a dove, thank you so much. Welcome in. Come in. Take a look around. Let me know if I can help you in any way. But when it comes time to get your money, you better be shrewd as that serpent. Because you know how to do it. And, and it's not one or the other. It's both and. So he says, I want you to be wise like a snake, but yet harmless like a dove. Because not everybody that's in this world means you good. And you got to be discerning. He says, don't, don't be like uh, naive thinking that everybody is going to be like you because you love everybody and you kind and you would never harm anybody and you would never steal from anybody else. But don't, don't think that everybody else is not like that. I meant you trust but verify. So the innocent little dove in you, harmless as a dove, is saying, you know, yeah, yeah, I trust everybody, but excuse me, let me count my inventory here. Anybody understand what I'm talking about? This is... You, you got to mind your business. And he said, listen, you going into business, you need to be shrewd. You need to be uh, wise like a serpent and yet harmless as a dove. And so he's, he's giving them a picture here because we are going into a hostile environment. And he says, you got to have some wisdom when you go into a hostile environment so that you are not taken advantage of. And in such an, uh, an environment, the question is this, how can we advance the kingdom of God effectively without becoming predatory ourselves? That's, that's we, we have to realize I'm going into a dangerous territory where some people are going to see me as lunch and dinner, but I don't want to be eating as lunch and dinner. So I need to be uh, alert and I need to be uh, uh, aware of my surroundings. And so Jesus taught them to be Christ-like in a godless world. And in order to do that, he was saying, you're going to need to combine both wisdom along with the harmlessness of a dove. It is the same as, as the picture of the lion and the lamb. You know, every child of God has to have the meekness of a lamb in them, but also the boldness of a lion. And see, different situations call for different things to rise up. Because when somebody is messing with your children, it's time for a lion to rise up and say, excuse me. I mean, somebody trying to go after your husband, after your wife. <laughs> excuse me. Uh, so there, there's something that has to rise up to be able to survive in a dangerous, capricious environment. You need a discernment of this dual nature. Jesus had it. Jesus was meek as a lamb, but yet when, they, when he saw dishonesty in, in, the, in the temple, Jesus started flipping over tables. Righteous indignation. The lion and the lamb, not or. It was, it, was, it was the lion that rose up with the Pharisees and scribes when Jesus said, you brood of vipers. He called them snakes. 
Jesus is like, I, I know you. I see you in your religious garb and, and all your stuff hanging around your neck. You brood of your old snakes. You vipers, you venomous creatures. So Jesus was very woke, but yet harmless, so that he could navigate that world. And that's all that he's telling you, that I want you to go out and take my gospel into the world, but not everybody is going to be sweet and innocent. Some of them are going to be looking to kill you. They're coming after you. So he says, I want you to be wise. When you go into an environment like that, I want you to have your eyes wide open. I want you to be like as shrewd as a snake, but yet harmless as a dove. I want you to walk with a discernment and walk with a wisdom out in this world so that you are not their lunch, so that you are not their dinner. I want you to go and feed them, but not yourself. And so here... Here we are, and he's telling them, I want you to be kind to them. Go out into the world, and there's some dangerous folks that want to kill you, but be kind to them. You see, don't let the meanness in others change the goodness in you. You still be you. Don't let the wickedness and the evil in others stop you from being good and kind and patient and loving and affirming and encouraging. You be you. Don't let the bad in others suck the good out of you. You be you. Notice what uh, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the Apostle Peter mentions here. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 12. Live such good lives among the pagans, among these devil worshipers, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, that they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. So he says, listen, you see, he says, keep doing good. Let them see your good deeds and glorify God, even though they... Uh, accusing you of doing something wrong. He says, don't let them stop you from doing the good. In other words, be not weary in well-doing. Be not weary in well-doing, for you will reap in due season if you, if you don't quit. So he instructed us, be, be as smart as a snake, yet harmless as a dove. Now, if Jesus said that, years ago I thought about this, and I said, if Jesus said, be wise as a snake, how can we benefit from that if we don't know how a snake is? So that's why I thought that I'd teach on snake lessons. <laughs> Here are some lessons that we learn from the snake. Lessons we learn from the snake. Number one, snakes are one elongated body. Just one body. One body, if, if, when you understand a snake, it's just one elongated body. We are the body of Christ. One elongated body. No arms, no legs. No feet, just one body. Can you imagine being the head of your family, being the head of a company, the head of an organization, the head of a project? If you set the vision to say that this is where we're going and there's no argument, but everybody wraps themselves around that thing to say, you know what, this is our prey and we're going to wrap ourselves around it and constrict it with all that we have because as the head, the, the whole body of the serpent follows it, and so that's a good thing. Please understand, I, I, I know that as, 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 as people, we, we scatter snakes. I mean, I don't fool with snakes. But snakes are not the devil. They're a creation of God. And so they're neither good nor evil. They're controlled by nature. A snake will bite you not because it's evil, because that's its nature. So if you know that that's the nature, And if I'm a serpent and it, if he put that in my nature, that I'm going to bite you if you get on my back. If I wrap around your leg, I'm not trying to cuddle. That's the nature of the beast. It's cunning. It's not evil. It's smart because that's how it eats in order to survive. And there's a balance in the ecosystem for each thing to be able to do what it's in their nature to do. And all of the creatures that are governed by nature are not evil or good. They are, they're just God's creation doing what they do by their nature. So a snake is not evil by its nature, even though their slithering cells make us feel like that is Satan himself. <laughs> I feel the same way, but just so we together, we are together. I mean, if you see a snake, I'm gone. I'm out of there. <laughs> Call somebody. I'm not getting a broom, a golf club. I'm going to call somebody and I'm going to, y'all can have the house. You can have the room. I'm out of there. Anybody else understand? 
and I know people that have pet snakes. That's your pet snake. Y'all, you do that over there, let them slither. I was somewhere and they wanted to put one around my neck. I said, excuse me. Excuse me. I'm like, I've got a cross around my neck. But snakes are one elongated body. We can learn from that. They're not a divided body. And God is telling us, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he's given us this whole passage. Notice this. He says you can easily enough see how, how this kind of thing works by looking no further than your own body. Your body has many parts, limbs, organs, cells. But no matter how many parts you can name, you're still one body. You're just one body. And please understand that this body is not segmented. He's not like I've got a white body and a black body and a Latino body and an Asian body and an African body. He only has one body of Christ. They're one body of Christ. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is is growing. Did you know that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is growing faster now in Africa and in Asia and in South America than it is in the United States of America and in Europe? He's got a body that is growing in various parts of the world. People of every tongue and, and ethnos, every nation, every culture that the Spirit of God is moving and I'm telling you the winds of the Holy Ghost is causing revival in certain places. We might be diminishing here in the United States of America at the moment and over in Europe but I'm telling you there's a wind of God that is blowing and now Christianity is bigger in Africa, it's bigger in Asia, it's bigger in South America than it is in the United States and in Europe put together. Because God is up to something and he says I got one body. And, I, and, and when God gets a body, his body is not democratic and it's not republican. And it's not black and it's not white and it's not Latino and it's not Asian. He only has one body. And the body of Christ, it is the army and the agent of God in the earth sent to do the will of God. One body. So when Jesus Christ, who is the head of the church, said, gives us a great commission and said, go ye into all of the world. He's only got one body in the earth, only one body in the earth, not reaching out with our own agendas. He's only got one body in the earth, one body. We can learn from the unity of that. The only prayer of Jesus that still is yet to be answered is his prayer that he prayed in St. John chapter 17. Father, make them one, even as you and I are one. He prayed that we would come into this oneness of body that the snake has already mastered. So he says, go there and be like the snake. He's one body. So when a snake decides that I want want this little goat, this baby goat, I want the goat. The whole body wraps itself around that goat to constrict it until there's no life there. And then they say, dinner served. Dinner served. Because they all wrap themselves around it until they conquer the very thing that they go after. It's amazing that a snake doesn't have legs, but they can go up a tree. You will be surprised about the nature of a snake, what it does as one elongated body. And initially, it walked upright. Part of its curse is that it would slither on the ground. And slithering on the ground, it can still conquer its prey because it is one elongated body. And we are just one unified body. That's the first lesson that we learn from the snake. Snake lesson number two, snakes have no ears. Snakes have no ears. Next time that you're in the presence of a snake, check out and see if you can find the ears. (laughs) Just, just, Just check it out. They have no ears. Moses began to explain to the Lord, uh, you know, that he couldn't speak well. And you know how God responded to him? God responded to him in Exodus chapter 4 in verse 11. Here's what God said. Then God said to him, who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I the Lord? Who ever thought that God would make somebody deaf? God can be glorified in any situation. In any situation. Did you know it's a blessing to be deaf to some things? Because if you were deaf to the criticisms of people, you'd be free to be you. You got to learn how to be deaf to offensive words. There are some people that walk around with a stinky attitude all the time because of what somebody said. 
And if you learn to turn a deaf ear to offensive statements, you'd be surprised how much healthy that, that, uh, healthier that you, you would be just by learning to turn a deaf ear to the negative voice that runs into your head that tells you, uh, he's not going to want you. Nobody's ever going to love you. You'll never be able to do this, or you've never been able to finish anything that you start. When you get that, if you learn to turn a deaf ear, we can learn that from a serpent. The serpent has no ears. They have no ears. You check it out. They have no ears. There are certain things that you shouldn't give your ear to. Because here's the, here's, here's the principle. Wisdom is knowing what to ignore. Certain things you ought to take a deaf ear to. You ought to take a deaf ear to it. Sometimes if your child says something crosswise to you, I, I know you didn't just say that to me. You know, I, like you didn't even hear it so that you don't carry offense on the inside of you. The other day I got up to take a walk in my neighborhood. There was a new dog that's moved into the neighborhood. He didn't know me. I didn't know him. He's standing in the, in, in the, in the, in the driveway and, and he's doing what he, what he does. He's barking. He wasn't barking for my benefit. He's barking for the benefit of the man who owns him. He's barking for something. That's none of my business. I'm out trying to exercise, trying to get my uninterrupted cardio. I'm like, dude, I'm not here for you. I'm just passing through. Listen, there's some people that are, that are so anal. They got to say, hey, hey, you talking to me? You talking to me? You, you got something to say? Come on, say it to my face. And they end up starting a fight. And I'm, 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 I'm rehearsing the words of this message. Snakes have no ears. There's something that you got to act like you don't even hear. He wasn't talking to me. He wasn't sounding an alarm for me. He's an alarm system for the people that owned him. He's not working for me. And I could tell by his voice that he was old. But I got a goal. I'm, I, I've got a goal. I'm out here. On, I'm trying to get my heart rate at a certain level. I don't have time to stop with you and have a conversation. So you got to turn a deaf ear. You got to know that I don't have time to answer every barking dog. Turn a deaf ear. You're not my mission. You're not my destination. I'm not trying to come over there. I'm trying to exercise. I'm trying to get my heart rate out. I'm trying to stay alive. I'm trying to keep my blood pressure down. I, you, you stay over there. I'm, I'm minding my business. I don't have anything to do with you. I turned a deaf ear to him and I kept stepping. You got to be able to have people bop, 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 roo, 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 and you keep stepping because you're not going to take the time to waste your life trying to explain yourself to somebody who's already hell bent on misunderstanding you anyhow. You got to learn how to keep stepping. I've been dealing with dogs for a long time. I used to ride a motorcycle and I, when I delivered papers early in the morning and I used to have dogs that, that, that would come up, you know, I knew the houses that had the dogs that would run out and chase me. And so I started carrying rocks with me. I took a plank one time. I'm like, you come here, I'll crack your skull. I will crack your skull. You may come here, but you won't limp back. <laughs> but you got to know how to how to ignore the things that are best there as a distraction. And you got to realize that there are a lot of barking dogs that are on your journey trying to do nothing but distract your life. And you got to realize this has nothing to do with me and my spouse and my children. This is nothing but a distraction here. And you, you're gonna, you get online, somebody says a nasty comment under that, you got to try to defend yourself and try to come back at everybody that says something to you. I don't have time for that. I have a life. I don't have time to get my spirit bent out of shape trying to have an argument with somebody whose motives may not even be right anyway. They're just nitpicking because they don't have a life. I don't have time. Let do barking dogs bark. That's what they do. That is their nature. Turn a deaf ear. Be like a serpent that has no ears, but keep stepping. Keep stepping. We're just seeing what we can learn here from the snake. Snakes are one elongated body. Snakes have no ears. Number three, snakes have no voice. You don't, uh, snakes don't bark. They don't screech. They don't do anything. The only thing that they can do is blow air through their system. And that's where we get the hissing. Sss, sss. That's what he did to Eve. You know, sss, let me holler at you. Sss. <laughs> 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 
But snakes have no, they have no voice. They're quiet. Snakes are subtle. And God has said that when you're working on something, keep your mouth closed. Keep your mouth closed. Don't tell everybody, yeah, hey, yeah, I'm, I'm a, I got a new project. I'm going to invest in it. <laughs> keep your mouth closed. Handle your business. Build your empire. Work in silence and let your success speak for you. But work in silence. Snakes have no voice. They don't growl. They don't have a roar. Snakes have no voice. We can learn something from that. They have no voice. They are subtle. And that's one of the reasons that they're able to get their prey. Because they keep their mouth closed. Because people didn't see it coming. I was over in Costa Rica with my family. We'd going up. We were taking mud baths and stuff. And I saw a white lady there. She, uh, you know, was staying at the resort there at the mountains. It was very rustic. I asked her about her experience. She said, I was awaking in the night in my hotel room, in the resort, in the mountain. I said, tell me more. What happened? <laughs> she said, something was moving under my pillow. It was a boa constrictor. I said, what did you do? She jumped up and ran. When she opened the door to her room, there was a cluster of tarantulas hanging. And she ran to the manager's office and told them this, excuse me, something is in my room. When the manager came, the, the place was at capacity, they couldn't move her to another room. The manager came and searched the room, couldn't find it. How many of you know homegirls sat up the rest of the night? She never would have laid her head on that pillow had the snake been running his mouth. But they were quiet, no voice, so that it could constrict her body, choke her life out, and enjoy a nice dinner, quiet dinner. When you're trying to conquer something, keep your mouth closed, work in silence. Let your success speak for you. While your works are speaking, don't interrupt. Snakes have no voice. Notice Joshua chapter 6 and verse 10. But Joshua commanded the army, do not give a war cry. Do not raise your voices. Do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout, then shout. Work in silence. Work in silence. And then when God brings the victory, shout it from the housetop. That he healed me. That he delivered me. That he brought me out of the valley of the shadow of death. God brought me through it. When he does it, tell everybody. There's a time to shout and there's a time to hold your mouth together. Because every time that you speak what you're going through, you give life to it. And I don't mean about therapeutic things of somebody that's helping you through a process. But I'm just talking about it. Stop whining and griping and mealy-mouthing about every little thing that you're going through in your life. Because you give life to that thing. The moment you, you're, it, something that's killing you and the, you keep talking about it, you're speaking death to yourself. So God commanded them to keep their mouths shut until the appropriate time to shout when they were going to then bring the wall down. When you're in a battle, keep your mouth closed. When you're in a battle, keep your mouth closed. If you're in a legal battle, they have certain kinds of disclosure things where you cannot discuss the conditions of, of, the, of the agreements of, of, of your whole thing. Keep your mouth closed. And you can nullify the whole thing if you break that non-disclosure kind of agreement. Here's the fourth thing. Snakes have no eyelids. They have no eyelids. They're one elongated body. And then snakes have no ears. They have no voice. And they have no eyelids. What does that mean? It means that they are vigilant, that they are sober, that they are aware of their environments and their surroundings. They know what's going on. Notice uh, the admonition of 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. 
You know why the Bible says that he's seeking someone to devour? It's because the devil can't devour everybody. When you know who you are, he can't devour you. When you understand that I'm washed in the blood and I'm walking on the authority of a believer that I have in Christ, I know what my rights are, I know the privileges that appertain unto me, given me by the authority of his word. He knows that he can't. It's just like a bully. bully knows who, a bully knows who he can mess with and who he can't. A bully knows who she can mess with and who's, they know the, the right one to try. Because they know if they try Helen, Helen coming back upside your head and scratching your eyeballs out. And then she going to pull her, don't let, don't let her pull her earrings off and take her heels off. Because Helen finna go for your juggler vein. See, the devil knows who to mess with. He knows he can't come after everybody. There are some people that if he tries to come after you, they know you know the power of the blood. They know you're going to plead the blood. They know you're going to put the word on them. They know you're getting ready to go to another level in your intercessory prayer life. The devil knows who he can, he can devour. He knows weak people that don't know the word. They're going to fall apart the moment that he attacks you. But he knows somebody else that you put your hand on my child, I will kill you. You, put, you lay your, try it again, devil, do it again. In the name of Jesus, I put a blood... You, I mean, you begin to go in, you begin to go in, you begin to go in. You, I mean, when you have to turn your plate down, when you have to begin to fast before the Lord. Anybody know what I'm talking about? To where you're standing in a supernatural power of the Holy Ghost. The devil knows that he cannot devour everybody. Snakes have no eyelids. They're always aware. They're always looking. They're always looking. When you're a spiritual person, your child can be in another state and some foolish stuff starts to try to attack your child. God will wake you up at 2.38 in the morning and you'll sit straight up in the bed and say, hey, something going on with Charlene. Hey, there's something going on with that. What in the barrel? In the name of Jesus, Father, by the power of the Holy Ghost, I'm telling you, not every closed eye is sleeping. There's an eye in your spirit and I'm just here to tell you, he's letting us know I want you to be like a snake. Wise as a snake to where they are up here where they can see. Like you be careful of so and so and I know that my child is hanging around so and so and they mean them no good. This is not good. It just, it, they may fool your child but they don't fool you. Because your eye is open. Your eyelid is wide open. Snakes have no eyelids. They are sober. They are vigilant. They are watchful. They are alert. And he's saying we can learn that from a snake. You, you understand now? You're getting some understanding now why Jesus said be wise as a serpent. These little slithering things, they got more sense than what we realize. So that's number four. They have no eyelids. Here's number five. Snakes grow constantly. They grow constantly. They, they don't just reach a certain length and then that's it. They, they don't just reach 12 inches and that's it. 24 inches and that's it. 36 inches and that's it. 48 inches and, not, and that's it. No, no, no. You know that there are some snakes... Anacondas 25 feet long They grow all of their life. They never stop growing. They never stop growing. That's why you see Snakes shedding their old skin You see the skin of a snake has limited elasticity our uh, Skin as human beings we have much more elasticity to our skin than than they do That's why we can gain weight and we don't have to leave our old set of skin <laughs> You gain weight, and you, 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 your, your skin just keep on just. <laughs> it will accommodate. I mean, so you, you, you're in the same skin when you were size four as you're four, 14. And now, he, he, and, and, you, know, you know what I'm talking about, but when a snake goes from a four to a 14, they don't have the elasticity in their skin, so their skin won't grow with them, so they have to come out of it. And they grow and come out of their old skin for two reasons. Number one, because they're growing new skin up underneath the old skin. And number two, because parasites attach themselves to the old skin. So when they come out of that shell, they leave the parasite, all of the blood suckers that's been draining their life and you can never get ahead and you can't even save any money because you got parasites and you didn't have the strength but when you grow when you begin to feed yourself with the wisdom and the knowledge and the anointing of God I'm coming out of this old skin they have to they have to hit their nose on a rock or on a tree to cause a tear in their skin 
and the wound becomes a birthing place to where they then come out of the very thing that had been encapsulating them and now they begin to slither out and leave behind an old skin that didn't have the capacity to grow and also the parasites that were sucking the life to where it could never get ahead and it's now leaving all of that behind. It's time for us now to grow. I hope you understand now why the Lord is telling them, keep growing, keep growing. They grow constantly. He tells us 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2. Notice here the word of the Lord. As newborn babies desire the pure milk of the word that by it you may grow. And you keep growing. It's a never-ending process. You never get too old to grow. Don't ever, I don't, when you finish school, keep growing. When you go middle age, keep growing. When all of your children are growing and out of the house, keep growing. When you have grandchildren, keep growing. I mean, when, uh, as, as you start bearing your parents, keep growing. Keep growing. And just remember that every, every time that you get a wound in your life, a womb is a birthing place. It's a birthing place. Every time that you're hurt, God's opening up another place. He's birthing something else in your heart. Don't come out of your battle without your blessing. You're birthing a blessing. You're birthing a blessing. Every wound, every place of hurt is a place where new revelation comes, where new anointings come. And, and I'm just telling you that wherever, wherever you have a wound that, that, and the blood comes, see, the blood always rushes to where the hurt is. If you hit your leg, you hit your arm, the blood rushes there. That's why people bleed out because the blood rushes to the place of wound. The blood rushes to the place of attack. That's where the blood goes. But keep growing all of the days of your life. Keep feeding yourself so that you're growing. Keep feeding yourself so that you're growing all of the days of your life because growth is a constant of the Christian's life. Number six, snakes have one functional lung. One, just one functional lung. They have two lungs, but only one of them works. And notice Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed man of the dust of the, of the ground, and he breathed the breath, the pneuma, the ruach of God into the nostrils, man's nostrils, and, and the man became a living person, a living soul. But here's what I want you to realize. They only have one functional lung. That means that they get their inspiration from one source, and that's only from God. Notice, notice 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 21. You cannot drink from the cup of the Lord and from the cup of demons too. You cannot eat at the Lord's table and at the table of demons too. We've got too many Christians today that are dipping and dabbling into all kind of occultic practices. You're throwing sage over your left shoulder and burning, burning uh, incense and, and, and you've got all of the stuff that comes out of the occult and, uh, that's happening and using crystals and, uh, and you... you The snake has one lung. It's not getting inspiration from over here and from the world of the occult. And, and when I want to know when the world is going to happen in my life, I'm not following my zodiac. I want to know, is there a word from God? I want to know the one that created me, the one that called me out of darkness, the one that redeemed my soul, the one that hung on the cross and died for me. What does he have to say about me? I don't give a flip about I'm a Leo or you're an Aries or Sagittarius and see whether we're going to be compatible. If the Lord says this, I don't have to consult the stars. I am submitted to the Son of God. You can only get our inspiration from one lung, from one lung. Don't fool with the cup of God and the cup of, uh, uh, of the of devils too. You can't eat it at both tables. It's amazing what people the type, they get their inspiration. I don't need weed to give me inspiration. I don't need to hold down one and take a line of <laughs> in order to make me creative. Elohim is creator God. You can get into some realms of the power of the Holy Ghost. God will give you some dreams like he gave Ezekiel and he saw a four-faced man and he saw a six-winged creature. I mean, he started seeing some stuff and John the Revelator was high on the Holy Ghost and he didn't have to do any kind of this. And the good news of the gospel, this is not an indictment from anybody that's on substance abuse, but it is it's good news to say that Jesus is a deliverer. 
and he'll give you a high and will open you up to a psychedelic experience that'll blow your mind, that'll bring new life in you and it has no ill effects, no side effects, but it'll fill you with joy and peace and righteousness and love. Snakes only have one lung. They only get it from one source. Get your inspiration from one source. From one source. To inspire means to breathe in. To expire means to breathe out. God breathed into man. Shh, the Ruah, his spirit. Man became a living soul. God released Numa, spirit. Man comes from that and that sustains us. And number seven, snakes go everywhere. Snakes are on every inhabited continent in the world. Every inhabited continent. They go everywhere. And I want you to understand this. Particularly, snakes go to places of productivity. That's why in the Garden of Eden there was a snake. There was a snake. Snakes go to where things grow. Where things are cultivated. Where there's productivity. If you're growing a family, there's a snake around. There's a snake in every garden. You're growing a business, there's a snake. Trust me, there, there is a snake. Snakes are everywhere. I know you got snake away and you, you've prayed and. <laughs> but there's a snake slithering around in silence. Because they lay low, they're subtle. They don't run their mouth to give themselves away. And if they didn't open their mouth, you would, you'd walk in a room with them because you don't even know that they're there because they don't announce their presence. But a snake is there in every place of productivity, in every garden, in every place where something is being cultivated for good, in every feeding environment, there's a snake in every garden. Don't get it twisted. There's a snake in every garden. There's a snake in every church. Jesus chose 12 of them and he said, and one of you is a devil. Now if Jesus, who's a bread of life, had one in his group that he chose, how much more? That's why you got to keep your eyes open. And he just said, be wise, wise as a serpent. Be alert. And know that they're everywhere. Because he gave us a great commission and told us, go ye into all the world. In every inhabited place and take the gospel. It's a part of the great commission. Jesus told us, go into all the world. The snakes are in every inhabited continent. And notice, he said to them in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go into all the world. The snake is in every inhabited place. Every place. I've been on every continent. There's snakes on every continent where there are people. Every inhabited place. Every inhabited place. Jesus said, I want you to be like the serpent. Go, go to every inhabited place. And share the good news of the gospel. I pray that God will sharpen your discernment as he sends us out as sheep, harmless as a dove, but now that you go equipped wise as a serpent. And while God is doing things and while he's blessing you, keep your mouth closed until he's done the work and then testify and shout it from the housetop. There will come a time for you to shout. But in the meantime, God will just say, walk around it. Keep working. Keep working. Don't tell them about the war that's going on in your home. Just keep working. Keep walking. Keep praying. Be sober. Be vigilant. Act like you don't have any ears. No eyelids. Keep your, be, be vigilant. No voice. You're not whining and mealy-mouthing and griping and complaining. But he's bringing us into a place. He said, be wise as a serpent. Shrewd. Understanding. Discerning. Vigilant. Aware. And when we learn that we are sent out into a dangerous environment, but we are skilled, equipped for the journey. 
He's given us a wisdom to be able to skillfully navigate the terrain of where we are called to minister, to share our testimony. Wisdom, the shrewdness of a snake that can go everywhere where God's people are and share the good news that every place that we are, we have an assignment in that place. And may we ask God, God, show me. While you're just at home out in nature, God uses such natural things to teach us deep spiritual principles. Something as natural as a snake. And every garden has a snake. Every garden has a snake. But be sober. Be vigilant. Be one elongated body so that you wrap yourself around the cause of the vision that comes from headship and grab it with all of your might with no ears so nobody can talk you out of it but that you will fulfill God's will and purpose for your life. Bow your heads. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.